Hello, welcome to LMU Community TV News. I'm Ashley Hurley. Thank you for joining us. A Tennessee Highway Patrol trooper and his family will be honored this Friday with the John L. Martin Award. The award will be presented in honor of Sergeant Joshua Mabe of the Tennessee Highway Patrol, who was killed in a farming accident on June 6th in neighboring Hancock County. Family members will be presented a plaque Friday morning at 10 o'clock inside the Claiborne County Justice Center training room. The presentation will be made by retired District Attorney General Paul Phillips. The public is invited to attend this ceremony. Trooper Mabe is survived by his wife Victoria and five-year-old daughter Adeline and his parents Kenneth and Velma Mabe. Mabe joined the Highway Patrol after earning an associate degree from Walter State Community College and a bachelor's degree from Tusculum College. He was the Fall Branch District Trooper of the year in 2008 when he wrote a total of 1,126 citations, including 29 citations for the violation of child restraint law, which was the highest in the district. He was promoted to sergeant over Granger County shortly before his tragic death. The award is presented by the Wilderness Road Kiwanis Club of Claiborne County and is named in honor of Lee County, Virginia Deputy John L. Martin, who was shot three times on November 4th, 1988, while checking on a break-in and burglary in progress at the Western Lee County Health Clinic in Ewing. The 14-year veteran and father of Ford died three days later. Former posthumous re recipients include Tennessee Highway Patrol Trooper Doug Tripp, New Tazewell Police Officer George Brooks, Bell County, Kentucky Canine Officer Sean Percival and his canine King, and Union County Officer Andrew Davidson. Effective January 1st of 2016, Brian Kessler, D.O., will become the second dean of Lincoln Memorial University DeBus College of Osteopathic Medicine. Kessler is currently the associate dean for clinical affairs at the Campbell University Jerry M. Wallace School of Osteopathic Medicine. A board-certified family physician, he has a vast knowledge of primary care medicine and health policy and appreciates the vital role that primary care physicians have in training the next generation of osteopathic physicians. President B. James Dawson announced Kessler following an exhaustive national search and is confident that Kessler is the right person to lead LMUDCOM as it continues to mature and grow. Kessler is a graduate of Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine in Erie, Pennsylvania. He is the former Chief Academic Officer at Cleveland Clinic South Point Hospital and has served in family practice since 2001. Kessler is married to Dr. Iona Kessler, also an accomplished osteopathic family physician, and they have three children, Katie, Ethan, and Evan. The Lincoln Memorial University Carter and Moyers School of Education will present the next installment of its Upholding the Constitution lecture series featuring United States Congressman John J. Duncan Jr. this Friday, October 16th. Duncan's presentation is entitled, The Constitution Today, The Founding Fathers Would Be Shocked. Duncan currently serves as ranking member of the House Committee on Transportation and in Infrastructures, Highways and Transit Subcommittee. The one-day seminar is open to teacher, teachers, pre-service educators, students, legal and law, legal professionals and law students, and the program will take place from 9 to 1.30 in the Business and Education Building on LMU's main campus. Registration opens at 8 o'clock that morning, and the seminar is entirely underwritten and provided to participants at no cost. A continental breakfast, lunch, and all printed materials are included. Registration is required, and for more information, you can contact Sue England at 423-869-6253. Following the huge success of Paint the Mall Pink, two weeks ago, Middlesbrough Mall has continued with events for breast cancer awareness throughout the month. A special tree lighting ceremony and balloon release was held in honor of breast cancer survivors in the community. The events held are to raise awareness that early detection saves lives. 
Annual mammograms are essential, and for women who do not have insurance coverage for mammograms or for those who have high insurance deductibles, Middlesboro Appalachian Regional Hospital is offering a special rate of $50 throughout the month of October. The cost does include the radiologist report. The next event to be held is a Think Pink event planned for staff and visitors for the ARH Hospital tomorrow, Tuesday, October 13th. And coming up this Friday, October 16th, Middlesboro ARH will take part in the Pink Tie Masquerade Ball Charity Fundraiser to be held at Pine Mountain, Repo Pine Mountain Resort State Park. Tickets to the ball are $50 and can be purchased from Elaine Smith, who can be reached at 606-242-1422. All proceeds from the event go to the Susan G. Common Foundation. And be sure you stay with us throughout the month of October for more great information on how you can spread the word about Breast Cancer Awareness Month and help save lives. Well, coming up after the break, we are going to recap the homecoming festivities that took place here on the campus of Lincoln Memorial University and also discuss a new event premiering this Friday. So stay right here with us. foods to the right temperature using a food thermometer. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Every day across America, excess food is gathered by a network of good people at local food banks, giving hope to millions of children who struggle with hunger. They've earned their wings, and you can too. Together, we can solve child hunger. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. A redhead. <gasps> Staring contest. You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. The dad was cute. You were looking right at us. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Welcome back. This Thursday will mark the first conference for the Center for Animal Health in Appalachia at the DeBusk Veterinary Teaching Center in Harrogate and Lee County, Virginia. It's the first annual CAHA conference that will be held on an annual basis at the for animal and public health issues in Appalachia that will be held each October. The mission of the Center for Animal Health in Appalachia will involve the release of a report on, sta on the state of animal health in Appalachia, plus a wide-ranging presentation and discussions on cutting-edge issues. The goal is to inform and pull together innovative ideas to help veterinary professionals on human health care, government, and higher education to better meet the acute needs of the people and animals of the region. CAHA's goal is to inform and pull together the ideas to help the veterinaries for better to help the needs in the health care issues. For more information, you can contact Ashley Knott at 423-869-6037 or you can email CAHA at lmunet.edu. Well, alumni experienced a significant change to homecoming at Lincoln Memorial this year as the university expanded on its traditional schedule to include Gather in the Gap, which is a free outdoor community concert in Cumberland Gap that was held this past Saturday afternoon with local favorite Tazewell Pike, who opened for Steve Gully in the Cumberland Mountain Music Show. 
The weekend festivities kicked off with the Rail Splitter 5K Night Run and Walk on Thursday with karaoke and an ice cream social on the quad. A Live to Lead simulcast of the John Maxwell Leadership Conference was held Friday morning at the LMU DeBus College of Osteopathic Medicine. The university then dedicated four classrooms in the Hamilton Math and Science Building honoring professors Kermit Bailey, Herman Matthews, and Louis Lutz, as well as LMU DCOM founding dean Ray Stowers, all who have helped shape generations of rail splitters. Saturday morning started with the president's breakfast that was open to all alumni. Dr. Dawson gave his state of the school address and also took questions from the alumni. The breakfast was then followed with the induction of six new members of the LMU's Athletes Hall of Fame that was followed by a family fun barbecue on the quad at noon. The homecoming celebration concluded Saturday night at the Gather in the Gap concert. Dr. Edwin Robertson was honored Friday afternoon with a dedication held at the Hamilton Math and Science Building. A plaque stands in, in memory of his love and commitment to this community inside the Harrogate City Park. Dr. Robertson worked tirelessly in every endeavor that he undertook with the goal always to leave things better than when he started. He was instrumental in incorporating the city of Harrogate where he was chairman of the Harrogate Tree Board and helped develop the Harrogate Walking Trail, a greenway that connects Cumberland Gap High School to the town of Cumberland Gap. The goal was to provide health and recreational benefits to Harrogate residents for years to come. Dr. Robertson had many callings in his life, but the greatest was his faith and passion for helping people. He was a very active member of Pump Springs Baptist Church and was part of the leadership team that founded Servolution Health Services. He was also on the leadership team of Stand in the Gap, the Coalition. Robertson was an Auburn-trained veterinarian and founded the Harrogate Hospital for Animals and it pioneered embryo transfers, making a name for himself globally. He worked closely with LMU administration on a number of projects over the years, including the establishment of the Veterinary Technology Program and the College of Veterinary Medicine. He served as a member of the Board of Trustees, Properties Committee, and on the committee of the J. Frank White Academy. Dr. Robertson was honored with remarks by guests and family that included Reverend Scott Cannon of Pump Springs Baptist Church, President B. James Dawson of LMU, Dr. Gary Burchett, Chairman of the Executive Committee for LMU's Board of Trustees, Deborah Chumley of the Wellness Director of Servolution, Steve Roark, Chair of the Harrogate Tree Board, and Edwin Robertson's own son, Adam Robertson. Rain delays put some high school football games on hold Friday night, but our sports anchor Adam Haley braved the conditions to bring you the stats and scores from the Old Town Grill Game of the Week. So be sure you stay with us for your sports update. Getting out of the military, I was missing this camaraderie. It's frustrating when you try and talk to people that don't understand. I would be talking, but I wasn't there with them. You just feel so alone. I still had the anger. I still had the addictions, but we didn't talk about that came to a point where it's like, okay, I really need to talk to somebody about this. Family more or less encouraged me, you know, go, go to the VA, you're a veteran, see what they can do to help you. When you have family, friends, when you have the facilities like the VA and the vet center, it gives me, it gives others encouragement to keep moving forward. It's okay to go get help. It's okay to talk to people, because it takes true strength to ask for help. Talking with, with other veterans was the best method for learning the roadmap to success. Hear veterans real stories of strength and recovery at maketheconnection.net. Cinderella found the pet that fits her perfectly. Tiana gave her pet the royal treatment. Belle found beauty where no one else did. 
And you can too. Share your heart. Share your love. Bring home your forever friend. Make a shelter pet part of your world. Happily Ever After begins at the shelterpetproject.org. Welcome back. The LMU volleyball team spent this past weekend in South Carolina for the SAC versus Peach Belt Conference Challenge. The Lady Rail Splitter's first game last Friday was a successful one against Francis Marion. LMU started in set one with a 4-14 hitting percentage, and it was the start to a 3-0 sweep as LMU won 25-19, 25-17, and 28-26. Uh, Kiera Holland led the Lady Rail Splitters with 10 kills. Later on Friday, the Lady Rail Splitters faced Lander, and early on it looked like LMU was going to keep their momentum going from their first game as LMU took set one, 25-17. Then the ladies were brought back down to earth. Ten hitting errors hurt LMU as they dropped set two, 25-23. A negative hitting percentage doomed LMU in set three as Lander took it, 25-11. And then the Bearcats finished off the Lady Rail Splitters in the fourth set, 25-22, to win 3-1. Liz Brock and Kiara Holland led LMU with 11 kills each. On Saturday, the ladies faced USC Aiken with revenge on their mind as the Pacers had defeated LMU earlier in the year. However, this match would end the same way the previous match did as USC Aiken swept LMU 25-18, 25-21, and 25-19. USC Aiken led in the kills department by a count of 58-38 in the win. The loss dropped LMU to 8-8 eight eight on the season. They'll be back in action this weekend as they'll travel to Brevard and Lenore Ryan. In soccer, the LMU men and women were at home this past weekend for a homecoming match against the Wolves of Newberry College. The women got the day started off and early on it was Newberry controlling the match as the majority of the first half was spent near LMU's goalie. The Wolves' Valerie Newcomb hit a long kick from near midfield that appeared to be a pass but took a couple big bounces and found itself over Catherine Lundy's head and in the net to give Newberry the early 1-0 lead at the 29-07 mark in the first half. The Wolves' Elizabeth Gutierrez added another goal in the 59th minute for insurance as Newberry would eventually defeat LMU 2-1. Lady Rustler Olivia Thompson added a goal in the 77th minute to prevent the shutout. The loss drops LMU to 3-5-3 overall and 1-4-2 in conference play. The LMU men came into Saturday on a two-game losing streak, but Newberry had not won a game in conference. LMU attacked quick and often. Donalo Da Silva scored in the 11th minute off a Lucas Coral pass to give LMU the one to nothing lead. That would be all the offense they would need, but for good measure, Leonardo Da Silva added his sixth goal of the season in the 24th minute. Enrique Rezic added a goal in the 38th minute and again in the 60th minute, while Victor Perez finished off the LMU scoring in the 75th minute to complete the 5 to nothing win. The win improves the Rail Splitters a 7-2-1 and 4-2-1 in conference play on the season. Now let's take a look at the high school football scoreboard from last Friday. Cumberland Gap dropped their 15th straight game, this time to regional opponent South Green, 41-6. The loss eliminates the Panthers from the playoffs this season and will mark the third straight year they have missed the postseason. Claiborne fell to fifth-ranked Elizabeth in 62-14. The 62 points given up were the second most a Claiborne team has given up at home and puts Claiborne in a must-win situation for the postseason. The Bulldogs will have to win out and get some help to play in November at the end of this year. Sixth-ranked Bell County, Kentucky defeated Campbell County 41-31. Bobcat running back Trayton Humfleet rushed for 175 yards on 31 carries and had four touchdowns in the win. And Oneida shut out Jellicoe 21-0. The Blue Devils are now a game out of the playoff position with three regional games left. In Kentucky, ninth-ranked Lexington Christian defeated Middlesbrough 56-19. Eagles running back Dylan Wheatley rushed for 323 yards and six touchdowns in the victory. Pineville continues to roll this season as they picked up win number five on the year, this time against Lincamp 36-0. Lawrence Simpson and Tuck Woolham combined for 29 rushes, 320 yards, and three touchdowns in the win. And in Virginia last Thursday, the surprising Hancock County Indians won again, this time against Thomas Walker by the score of 8-2. We'll preview the games coming up this weekend on our weekend edition of LMU Community TV Sports later on in the week. The Sprint Cup Series traveled to Charlotte, North Carolina for what was supposed to be the only night race in the chase. But as luck and Mother Nature would have it, the rain took over and pushed the race to Sunday. Matt Kenseth won the pole and led 72 laps before his luck ran out. Kenseth hit the wall a few times midway through the race and finished 42nd. Kenseth's bad breaks paved the way for Penske driver Joey Logano to take over and dominate, and that he did, leading 227 
of the 334 laps on his way to his fourth win of the season and his first at Charlotte. The win also advances him to the third round of the chase in a few weeks. Kevin Harvick took second, followed by Martin Truex Jr., Denny Hamlin, and Kurt Busch. Drivers Ryan Newman, Kyle Busch, Dale Earnhardt Jr., and Matt Kenseth now all sit in the elimination spots of the contender round as the Sprint Cups will move to the Kansas Speedway next Sunday. Now that's all for sports, but stay tuned after the break as Joseph Lewis will let us know if the Martian held on to the top spot this weekend when he brings you the box office report when we return on LMU Community TV News. She couldn't wait. She had imagined the day for as long as she could remember. The anticipation had been building. The shopping, the dress, the jewelry. Celebrating with her friends would be the sign that they had finally made it. Only she didn't make it. According to mad.org, teen alcohol use kills 4,700 people each year. That's more than all illegal drugs combined. Car crashes are the leading cause of death for teens, and about a quarter of those crashes involve an underage drinker. Don't add to these statistics. Take a stand against underage drinking. The future is in your hands. One, two. Me. One in three teens in the U.S. is a victim of abuse by a dating partner. Numbers are important in sports, but now the number we want is zero. Zero victims, zero offenders, no more. We make up a larger team, Abe's team. We're asking you to join Abe's team and be a part of no more. So maybe you're wondering, what does it take to be on Abe's team? Active bystander efforts. Step in when you see someone needs help. Ask what you can do. Believe victims. Extend your support. Act better everywhere and expect your friends to do so too. Always be enthusiastic, especially in obtaining consent. Avoid belligerent egos who coerce, bully, or threaten. Alcohol brings error and I will not leave a friend behind. Join Abe's team and say no more. Let's be hashtag Abe healthy. And Lincoln once said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. And that is my religion. In the spirit of Lincoln, let us support one another to do good. Join Abe's team and be Abe healthy by participating in active bystander efforts. Hello, I'm Joseph Lewis bringing you all the latest information in the world of movies. Tops at the box office this weekend were led once again by Ridley Scott's latest sci-fi saga, The Martian, holding strong at number one with $37 million, a relatively minor drop that leaves its domestic total landing at $108 million after only two weekends. Following at number two, also for the second week in a row, was Hotel Transylvania 2 with $20 million, the animated sequel now having grossed $116 million domestically, nearly $20 million more than the first Hotel Transylvania had accumulated at this point in its release. And rounding out the top three in its debut was Joe Wright's Peter Pan origin story Pan with $15 million, a mere tenth of its yeah. production budget, and an underwhelming opening for a film headlined by a major director, a star-studded cast, an obvious sense of spectacle, and universal appeal. The Martian makes for an interesting point of comparison with Pan, as it features all of these same qualities and is effectively taking the box office by storm. However, while The Martian has been met with widespread critical favor and sits at a 93% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, Pan's greetings have been decidedly less enthusiastic, its rating sitting at a low 25%, which could account for its meager financial performance. Finishing out the top five was Nancy Meyer's comedic character study The Intern with $8 million, followed by Denny Veneuve's crime thriller Sicario with $7 million, while the Robert Zemeckis directed The Walk continued to underperform with $3.5 million, despite its nationwide expansion and positive word of mouth. In review this week is The Martian, in which Matt Damon stars as an astronaut inadvertently abandoned on Mars by his crew and forced to survive on his own as he awaits a rescue. Based on the acclaimed novel by Andy Weir and penned by Buffy and Cabin in the Woods writer Drew Goddard, The Martian makes itself distinct from other sci-fi pictures in that it has a genuine and infectious passion for the science at its center. A large portion of the film is a one-man show as Damon puts his knowledge of botany and other disciplines to use, 
approaching each new challenge with a compelling determination and a more than welcome sense of humor. If anything, the character occasionally seems too capable in the face of odds that should be insurmountable, though the crew's rescue mission eventually escalates to such intimidating heights, literally and figuratively, that it's hard not to get wrapped up in the story's awe-inspiring climax. It's always great to see Ridley Scott working in this genre, and while The Martian doesn't quite reach the masterful heights of Alien or Blade Runner, it's the filmmaker's most accessible and entertaining movie in several years, with a smart, witty script and an impressive supporting cast packed with A-listers, including Jessica Chastain, Chiwetel Ejiofor, Jeff Daniels, and many others. Following in the recent trend of prestigious, big-budget journeys through space like Gravity and Interstellar, the visuals and special effects are top-notch as the film creates a Mars that seems real and tangible, and a simulation of space travel that makes viewers feel as though they're along for the ride. Also in review this week is The Green Inferno, director Eli Roth's long-awaited return to the big screen and his first film in the eight years since Hostel Part Two. Centered around a group of student activists on a mission in the Amazon rainforest who find themselves victimized by a native tribe, the film pays loving homage to Italian exploitation films of the 70s and 80s, most notably Cannibal Holocaust. In effect, The Green Inferno is an intense and shocking experience that won't be for everyone, but fans of the director and the genre should take note, for its sequences of horror are graphic and visceral in a way that is truly disturbing, mixing with its brutality a pointed satirical bent that makes mincemeat of overprivileged youth and modern social justice fads. Roth's lowbrow sense of humor occasionally derails the story, and with the exception of heroine Lorenza Itzo, the acting isn't the greatest, but on the whole, the film is disturbing and provocative in precisely the way it intends to be, and would certainly provide good Halloween viewing for those with strong constitutions. That's all for today in the world of movies. I'm Joseph Lewis. She couldn't wait. She had imagined the day for as long as she could remember. The anticipation had been building. The shopping, the dress, the jewelry. Celebrating with her friends would be the sign that they had finally made it. Only, she didn't make it. According to MAD.org, teen alcohol use kills 4,700 people each year. That's more than all illegal drugs combined. Car crashes are the leading cause of death for teens, and about a quarter of those crashes involve an underage drinker. Don't add to these statistics. Take a stand against underage drinking. The future is in your hands. And that is going to do it for this week's LMU Community TV News. Thank you for joining us. For everyone behind the scenes, I'm Ashley Hurley. We will see you on your weekend edition.